What's up? Welcome in Hogan Johns, the podcast, but not Hogan Johns, the people. It's Hogue and the Fishman. Kevin Fishbane is here to wrap up Bears minicamp with our second episode of the week. What's up, Kev? Johnsy wrapped up minicamp early. Yeah. He, pull, he pulled the John Fox. I, yeah. We, t- we talked a little bit about that yesterday. I can tell you didn't listen to the pod yesterday because you didn't know your coworker <laughs> wasn't going to be at Hal's Hall today. I did not. I did not. I was wonder. I thought maybe he didn't get the memos in early practice. I was looking around. I knew he was leaving for his vacation today. Yeah. You know, but hey, look, some of us went to practice today. Some of us didn't. Hey, he was wrong because he was like, ah, oh, they're not even going to practice. They're going to cut it short. No, they went through with the it was a shortened practice anyway. That was on the schedule, but. He went through with what was on the schedule. They didn't just cancel it. Yeah, it, it, it was an intense shortened period. <laughs> like it was like you know, not that I should have been surprised. It's it's floose ball, but it was uh, loose ball. Yeah, yeah, it was intense red zone situations. The do you like the move the ball drill? I like I like that. Where they just, just move like, it to different spots. Yeah, it's like put the ball down. It's like third and seven. Go, go. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. Not I, I, I will. I also note from practice today when uh, the special team started, uh, that was when I went to go take some shade. Yes. And it's nice now because you can't do that. You have to watch special teams. So if anything ever happens during special teams, you can fill me in. Yeah. I was talking to your CHGO co-host, Nick, about this. It's funny you're bringing this up because he brought this up on the CHGO show today, too. He said, you guys enjoyed a, apparently a romantic moment by the water cooler in the shade while I was out there in the heat consuming everything about Richard Hightower's special teams. Hey, so is Trenton Gill going to be the kickoff guy? Yeah, I, meant to, I don't I meant to ask you that today. Um, So here's a question for you. Well, they had, have they really done kickoff? So I mean, he, he was doing a couple today, but they were not like full kickoff. Yeah, I didn't want to put too. Here's the reason why I didn't want to put too much stock in this. A couple of things. One is those kickers are on kicking schedules. Right. Uh, by kickers, I mean the actual kicker, not the punter. So it could have been a day because Cairo didn't do any field goals today, right? Not that I saw. It no. may have been a non-kicking day for him, in which case it makes sense to have Gill handle those. And then they, what they were doing were kind of specialty kicks not full on kickoff. So that's why I didn't want to make too much that I do think that's something to keep an eye on though, because Trenton Gill did, does have experience doing kickoffs, even though he was North yeah. Carolina state's punter. I, I would definitely take a look at it because while they weren't full kickoffs, you could just have the jugs machine do that. Like they purpose, like they had Gill do it today. Yeah. So, you know, I, that's true. Something to listen when was the last time the Bears had a kickoff specialist? Uh, a kickoff specialist. Pat O'Donnell had to do it a few times. Yeah. But I think that yeah. was out of necessity. Yeah, it's been, I can't remember the last time the punter handled kickoffs for them. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, maybe Pat Manley probably knows the answer to that. Oh, I'm sure he would. Um, I appreciate you starting the show today with special teams talk. Of course. I'm I, not I, so sure know, our listeners do, though. That's Well, th- they're just happy I'm here. Um, they should be happy. I'm happy you're here. You know, you showed you. up to practice today. I did. I, I was giving John's crap because he also scheduled a, his last vacation during the first mini camp back in April. <laughs> that he did. So, um, all right. Hey, uh, I do want to warn you guys. So this is day three of me doing these shows outside as I am displaced from my office as the floors are being done. Um, Thursday happens to be lawn day. Uh, in the neighborhood, so there's a lot of uh, noise out here. I don't know if you guys you can even hear it. I can hear it. So we're gonna have a little bit of a uh, like classic summertime, suburban summertime uh, soundtrack in the background, if you will. Well, I think it's perfect because every day on the last day of mini camp, you know what songs going through my head? School's out for summer. Oh uh, yeah. And I'm always thinking of the opening scene of Days and Confused. Yes. Too, mm-hmm. You know, um, which, by the way, if you're looking for a summer book last summer, I read like the oral history of Days and Confused. If you're a fan of the movie, incredible book. What year did Days and Confused come out? That was a you 90s th- movie, right? Yeah. You, you would think I would know that because I read the book. It was a 90s movie about the 70s. 
93. Yeah. 1993. Uh, which makes because we did an 80s movies draft last week. You did. I liked you. I liked your team, by the way. I meant to tell you that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was a blowout. It was pretty much an easy consensus. And, um, um, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I was proud of myself because, like, I was born in 86. So I, you know, shouldn't necessarily be an 80s movies buff. 90s, I feel like I would feel the pressure. Like, I have to win this. Right. So. I was kind of doing some advanced scouting there with Dazed and Confused to make sure it was a 90s film because I love that well, movie. Well, that's why, that's why we work well with John's. You know, John's being born in the early 70s. You know, he's an 80s movies guy. Yeah. He's the old uh, guy on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Right? He should know all the 70s stuff. I feel like it's about to get really loud here, so I'm, like, trying to reach for different headphones because I can barely even hear what's going on. <laughs> You're good. I, I don't think the listeners are picking up much of the... I'm sure they're the not. I, actually, I'm sure it'll sound fine on the pod, but I still need to be able to hear you or it's going to be an awkward pod. I, I think some listeners would disagree with that. <laughs> they might tell you you don't need to hear me. Better to, to not yeah. be able to hear you. So I'm going to do a quick switch. Still should be able to hear. Oh, that's way better. That is way better. And the inventor of the headphones rests talk, easily. Talk to me, Goose. Talk to me. Have you seen the new Top Gun? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We challenged Johnsy to do that during his time off to go see Top Gun so we can finally review it. Have you seen it? I have not. No. Oh. So you got to go uh, see it, too. Then we can do a full-on July movie review of Top Gun. There's a there's a select group of movies that I embarrassingly didn't see until, like, later in life. Top Gun is, I like, I didn't see Top Gun until I think I was in college. Wow, you're like the third person who has said that to me recently, and it blows my mind. Now, did you still you know, enjoy it? Yeah, no, I did. I definitely did. I, I think, you know, so much of movies you see when you're younger is, is parent influence, and I, I guess my parents weren't, must have not been top of their list. Um, so it just was never a movie that came, you know, came across the desk, as they say. I just well, hadn't, didn't well, see it till college. So Kevin Kaduk at CHGO was in the similar, he's like, ah, I just saw it recently. And he's like, yeah, he's okay. He's like, it's just fine. He's like, I didn't really like the special effects. <laughs> I'm like, the movie was made in 85. What, yeah. Like, you can't watch it in 2000, whatever, and be like, ah, yeah, you know, that's not up to par. You know, this isn't quite Iron Man. You know, like, what? I will tell you, the, the 80s Tom Cruise movie that I did watch with my parents, and I wouldn't recommend parents watching this with teenage children, <laughs> is Risky Business. Nice. Nice. Yeah. My yeah, mom... Was- my mom I claims considered. she for she forgot the train scene. Okay, I, I mean I knew okay. the premise, and I was like, all right, the premise is a little risque, if you will. Risque, risque. But my, my mom's like, oh, we're gonna watch this as a family. That is not like a family movie. No. You know, I have two so. stories like that. Uh, two two movies I watched. Um, one was like awkward. The other one was just like probably more on my dad that I don't think he probably should have brought me to that movie at that age. Uh, Because we went and saw it at the Biograph Theater in Chicago. Um, That one was The Big Lebowski. The one, The Big Uh, Lebowski, which I think I was 10 or what year did Big? Now I want to say Big Lebowski came out in 98, which would have made me 12. Yeah, 1998. Yep, I'm right on that. There are a couple couple scenes in that. that, Yeah, what does I got? I don't know though. A lot of, it's probably okay, but a lot of language. And by the way, that is my, I would probably put it as my favorite movie of all time. It's um, it's one of the, one of the best. Yeah. So it did, it had a positive impression on me. So it actually it wasn't a bad move by my dad bringing me to that movie. It, it paid off. Um, the one that was just awkward, because I don't think any of us knew what we were getting into, including myself. The first time I watched American Pie was with my parents. Mm, yeah, that's, that's not a, that's. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, how do you get out of that one? Like, uh, once it start, like, I don't know, by the by the first time you get through that first scene, like 10 minutes in, like, I'm like, um, how yeah. do I get out of this? I feel stuck. I feel trapped now. It's interesting that, that I feel like that still maintains as you get older. Like, yeah. I'll talk about shows with my parents or my in-laws, but, like, I don't want to watch those shows with them. <laughs> yes. Hey, we had a guest just now. Come yeah, by on the podcast. I, they're here. I'm telling you. All right, yeah. you know now we now we're getting the ambiance. I didn't By the way, th- this is this up. is our show, right? We're just talking movies. Yeah. Um, no, we're not. We're gonna do winners and losers of Bears training camp. But as uh, 
I always think about these moments like, um, yeah, it's a little weird to like just have these land landscaping guys like walking through the pod here. But what are they thinking as they see me sitting here talking they're, to you through the? They're computer? probably thinking I'm about to show up on the Hogan Fishbane podcast. Probably make a surprise appearance. Should I ask them who their winners and losers of the Bears offseason are? Um, First loser of the Bears offseason, Adam Johns. Adam Johns missed the last day of minicamp. He missed all three days of the first minicamp. I yeah. mean, you talk about, you know, all this talk about Robert Quinn not being in the offseason program. I mean, Adam Johns was an unreliable participant in the offseason program. He, he better bring his track shoes next month. <laughs> and did he plan a vacation that week, too? He claimed he didn't know minicamp was this week. Isn't hasn't am I wrong? Hasn't this minicamp been this week of June every year since we've covered this team? It has been every year. Uh, okay. We were also given the dates on February twenty eighth for the entire offseason training program. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm excited for him to listen to this episode. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, he probably won't, but that's fine too. All right. So we are officially at the end of the offseason program. They have. Uh, we saw the parade of fancy cars leaving house hall today uh they have been released school is out for summer and we've seen a lot we've been able to see a lot of interesting developments some good some bad so we thought we would do winners and losers of the offseason program there are really no rules to this um we could have as many winners as many losers as we want we'll see if we agree but i will throw it to you First, let's start with some positivity. Who is your first winner of the offseason program? So my first winner are the defensive ends that played. So that would be Travis Gibson, Dominique okay. Robinson, and your guy, Carson Taylor. Yeah. Because what about I, what I, about Charles Snowden? Charles Snowden, you could throw him in there too. I, just I, I, sure. saw, I, I saw Dominic Robinson bat down a ball today at practice. We saw Carson Taylor do it yesterday. I think Travis, Travis Gibson has been – You can. it's it's really hard with line play, so I want to be careful. But right. I think they're, they're the winners, even if they didn't necessarily – even if it's hard for us to evaluate how well they played, I think they're just winners because they got so many reps. Yeah. You know, without Robert yeah. Quinn, without El- – Al-Kadi Muhammad was, you know, undisclosed injury, so he wasn't practicing throughout the program. Those guys got so many snaps and a lot for Dominique Robinson with the first team. So I think just getting that time, getting comfortable with their roles. Um, I think those guys, you know, and they flashed here and there too. So I, I would, I would say first winners would be the, the defense events. Okay. First winner, an entire position group. Yes. <laughs> um, I will go with an obvious candidate. I think rookie fifth round. Left tackle, Braxton Jones. I mean, look, there are certainly cases of late round draft picks becoming and undrafted guys becoming really good left tackles in the NFL. Jason Peters was an undrafted guy, wasn't he? You know, like uh, yes, that, yeah. that happens. Um, it's even happened for the Bears, like Charles Leno Jr. Hate him or love him. The guy started many, 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 many games in a row. Uh, more than any offensive lineman usually do, and he was a seventh round pick. You know, it was a, he was a good draft pick. So there are certainly cases of guys coming along that eventually become very good tackles. I don't remember ever seeing one be with the first team by the time OTAs are over. Like a fifth round or later pick, like that's am I? Yeah, I, I really cannot think of that as a as a like maybe by training camp, something like that. And I just feel like how else could you – you have to say Braxton Jones is a winner of this whole thing. Like he is in a right. position to to get first-team reps going into training camp. And, yes, it'll be very different when the pads go on, but he's still getting that opportunity. So he is a clear winner of the offseason, in my opinion. No, I agree. I, I think back, let's say, 2013, it was in the middle of training camp when Kyle Long and Jordan Mills – I think it was after the first preseason game, I want to okay. say – when those guys got so, and Mills was a fifth round pick. Mills was, Mills was a fifth rounder, yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I, I think they can say, "Oh, we're just trying out different combinations, etc." With the offensive line, you don't put him there if you don't think there's a chance that he could be your day one starter. It's mm-hmm. not to say he will be, 
but they actually have to have the belief that he's capable of handling it. So you give him that experience next to Cody Whitehair, working with Justin Fields. Um, yeah, I think I think for him, uh, th- this was a very positive, you know, final couple weeks of the of the offseason training program. All right, uh, your first loser of the offseason, then. Oh man, yeah. um, maybe that's not the right word. What what uh, else can we use? What well, the first uh, the first um, arrow pointing down in the offseason? Yeah, this is that's just not as catchy. Yeah. We can't do that. Well, all right. Here's someone who didn't win the off season. I know it's not catchy. It has to be Tevin Jenkins, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other side of the uh, Braxton yeah, Jones thing. Like I, I just, I get. We're gonna know so much more about these guys when the pads come on. That is the obvious disclaimer to all of this. And I, I there's just no way to spin the fact that he started getting second team reps. There's no way to spin it positively, right? For him individually i i know a lot of people have i've seen it in my mentions i've seen it in comments in our story what's the thing I saw, I, I saw somebody suggest that they know what they have in him so they wanted to try something different no 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 that's mm. that's not how it works. they don't know they, what they have in him. they don't know no. what they have in him. No. And, and i just think that you know again he could be he could be starting right tackle against 49ers on september 11th it's entirely possible but I think to lose two weeks of opportunities with that first group um, is not a not a good was not a good sign for for him for this this spring. Yeah, like in in maybe a good comparison is how Jalen Johnson. Remember, he was randomly getting those second team reps, mm-hmm. but that didn't continue. No, and I you think Jalen Johnson's had a good camp too. Yeah, so you know. The Tevin Jenkins thing continued, so we'll see what it all looks like. I guess when the uh, when when training camp comes around. Um, all right, I'm gonna say for my first loser, non-winner, non-winner. I'm kind of torn on this because I think someone just could say e- it. Just do it. Easily come back to me and be like, "Well, what is he really lost?" But I think at a minimum, Robert Quinn annoyed the new regime by not showing up this week to manage. Uh, I said this on our podcast on the podcast a month ago. I wrote it. What has Matt Eberflus said at the start of every press conference? He thanks the guys who are there. Yeah. Like, that's not an accident. Like, Mm -hmm. he values the guys that showed up. And I don't know what happened i don't know if robert quinn always knew he wasn't coming um and they always knew like i don't think we'll ever probably get the full details of this um but yeah (laughs) let's say hogue if the bears wanted to trade robert quinn in march guess what they would have done in march or april they would have traded him they would have traded him so obviously they were hoping that he'd be a part of this thing right um but the, I also would understand someone coming back to me like, okay, well, if what he gets out of this is a trade and that's what he wants, then did he really lose? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could. I he, think he at least say, lost some money this week. He lost some money this week. I, I mean, I think you can say just the Robert Quinn situation was a loss for the Bears. Just like in that, yeah. you know, if you're looking at winners and losers, I just think it was it was a disappointing part because this is somebody that I think that they – figured was in, in, and hoped would be part of this thing um all right your next winner uh how about uh a guy who we know who he'll be and what he'll be but he had a great spring and how about deandre houston carson okay i think i had him down for three interceptions yeah the uh, ball he did seem to find the ball a lot many of them off of off of uh yeah tip passes uh, can i throw another guy in here for a similar nose for the ball Unless it's gonna take away from your winner, it might be. I think right, well, I'll just I'll That's stick okay. with Tish. No, 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 well, I was gonna mention Jaquan Brisker. Yeah, that was gonna be my next guy. Right. Well, I'll let you talk about him. The, the thing with DHC is he's a lock to make the team. He's a lock to be your backup safety, uh, your special teams guy. So it's not like he necessarily needed to have a good camp. But I just think it's good for younger players to go out and see a, a guy who is just a pros pro. Um, who has carved out a, a niche for himself in this league, 
um, go out at, at mini camp and, and make plays. Um, and, and I think that, again, I think it's just a good guy to have around to have somebody like that um, for all these younger players who are trying to figure out how they can sustain long NFL careers. So props to DHC. Yeah, no, and and that's that's all certainly true. I'm going to go with Jaquan Brisker because, you know, it's same type of deal. Like this guy. Like, I remember when Eddie Jackson came out and he was a fourth round pick. Right. And we kind of got a vibe pretty early that he was going to maybe challenge for a starting spot. But that, that same thing like that wasn't really figured out until the preseason. Brisker came in day one and was like, oh, yeah, that guy's probably he might already be he might be the best safety on the team already. Just like that. And I, I don't think he's done anything since day one, but sort of cement that. And that's really impressive for a rookie to do. So I think Jaquan Brisker, clearly a winner, getting drafted in the second round. Maybe the best definition of a plug and play starter. Because when we say plug and play starter, we mean like week one. He was a plug and play starter day one of camp. Yep. Hey, Eberflu said, not afraid to, not afraid to play the rookies. Right. Um, all right, next loser, not winner. Not winner. Okay, so I made a list of some guys who well, – I guess I don't need to go through the whole list. Let's let's just focus on the nickel corner position. Uh, that's where I was going to go. All right, because I was thinking Tavon Young and Duke Shelley. I did not see them with the ones at all this week. Yeah, yeah. So, you know – and we could, I mean, the flip side of this, we could talk about Thomas Graham Jr. And, and folks can, I have, it's not that I've been bashing Thomas Graham Jr. I've just been very much wait and see with him. Like, I wanted to see because we hadn't seen it. So, like, I wanted to actually, you know, be able to have observations of him playing there. But I, I kind of thought this was going to be Tavon Young's spot. Didn't he have it in April at those, at the first set? Wasn't he the nickel or was it? I know Ibraflus was asked about him early on. I don't, uh, I honestly, I gotta be, you know, I guess that's why John skipped it because we were there yeah. and we can't even remember. So I just think that, you know, again, the, the, the winner, the positive says is Thomas Graham Jr. is obviously impressed, but I think it's, it's, it, I, I think there was probably a hope that that was going to be Tavon Young's job. It still could ultimately be his job. Um, but yeah, and you see, and then that also knocks Duke Shelley down. Not that I necessarily had high expectations for Duke Shelley, this training camp or mini camp. Um, but you would have thought he was kind of in the mix, and I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think he's in the mix to be a starting nickel, at least as of as of now. Yeah, that's why Duke Shelley was going to be on my list here because he just almost seems like he's become an afterthought a little bit. That yeah. you know, there was one point I saw him out there today, and I was like, oh yeah. Like, and there, that, that's what there's a there's a few of those guys left from the previous regime mm -hmm. that were always kind of backups, and you've seen them now lose their spots to new guys again not important necessarily guys in important positions but we're talking about roster battles here All right um so like like Dieter Island would be another guy in that category of I feel like so and it's not surprising I feel like some of the younger some of the draft picks are all ahead of him when it comes to the interior line on that depth chart yeah like and there's a big spot there that's open and you're just waiting for someone to fill it and um you know, so you're saying, well, why isn't he getting a chance? Well, there's usually a reason. All right, uh, well, let's do one more round, one more winner, one more loser. What do you got for winner? Okay, so my next winner, as you can see, how well I prepared for this. I'll is... go if you want to think about it. Yeah, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll think about it. Darnell Mooney. Mm -hmm. Darnell Mooney. Um, Darnell Mooney. I mean, this isn't a shock because everyone kind of already knows this, but his so clearly the best wide receiver on the team. Um, on one side, it it worries you, right? That there's really no one else in the vicinity. Uh, but on the other hand, I want to give him credit because he, to me, he looks better. Like he and he looks like all that time that he's been working with Justin Fields has paid off. Um, you know, there was a play in the back of the end zone today. Mm -hmm. which we had to do a little quick double check. Is that Darnell Mooney? Because everybody, everybody was wearing number 41. Uh, as the team honored Brian Piccolo, which was cool today, but also made it hard to watch practice. But that was like a trust throw from Justin Fields into the back of the end zone into a lot of traffic. And, you know, I, look, I'm totally in the camp that's skeptical that Darnell Mooney's really going to develop into like a 
huge, clear number one wide receiver. Can he really do that? That's been a big topic this offseason, right? But that was a go up and get it, get the feet down, tough type of catch that number one wide receivers make in the NFL. So I just think in general, whether he ever really becomes that or is that, he's still just a really, really good player. And there's absolutely no doubt about that after what we've seen this offseason. Yeah, I thought that was probably the best play of the day. Um, once we also we had to find out that it was Mooney, as you said. Um, but yeah, you you want to see that out of him. You want him to to look that great. Um, I'll, I'll stick with his draft class, and we we just touched on him, but I would say Jalen Johnson because okay. you know he takes back the starting role after that OTA practice. We saw him with the backups. He has the the nice pass deflection uh, when they were indoors last week. And then similar play, he gets the pick six. Um, he was in on a ball today, I think. Again, it's kind of hard because they were all wearing 41. Um, but it just seems like he's been back. He, he looks like the Jalen Johnson that we think he can be. I mean, I still want to see it, but I, but I think it's good to see the progress he made, um, especially as we kind of compared him to Tevin Jenkins, to see that progress to, sh- to be like, all right, he's that, yes, that's, that's the starting corner right now. Um, and it was good to see him make a few plays in the ball. All right. Um, for not winners, every wide receiver not named Darnell Mooney and <laughs> Bayless Jones Jr. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not necessarily calling Bayless Jones Jr. a winner yet, although I do think he's in a very good position to probably get a lot of balls thrown his way and play a lot. So you could make the case that, hey, for a third-round pick, that's winning. Um, my only hesitation with him so far – I think if he had come down with both of those tough jump balls yesterday in practice that went incomplete, I would have said, all right, that's answering the one question we still have about him, which is can he go make plays downfield in traffic uh, and go up and get the ball? And he didn't do that. So that doesn't really, in my eyes, make him like, all right, he's answered everything. So there's still more to – so I'm putting him kind of in the neutral category, um, but I also don't want to put him in the loser's category because I, I don't think he had all as all, you know, he doesn't belong there. But really, have you seen any other separation from any other wide receivers? Like the next guy I'd probably go to is Chris Fink. Hmm. Yeah. I, I I mean. And maybe many, Dante Pettis a little bit. Yeah. I'll like, say this. How, how many times did you write down 13 or 19 in your book, in your notes? Not enough. And that's Byron Pringle and Equimania St. Brown for those scoring at home. Yeah. I mean, I, that was one of my like top questions leading the offseason training program. Who is going to emerge at wide receiver? Yeah. And and nobody did. One of those two I think made a play today, but we could I couldn't tell who it was cuz there were I think it might have been Pringle. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed Pringle probably more than the others. I think his speed is there for sure. He's a little bigger than I thought. Yes, that was one of my first observations. He's listed as 6-1. He looks bigger. Yeah, and, and that, that's what we can notice at these things, right? Size and speed. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think even TJ Sharp has stood out at times um, just because of his, his length. Uh, but, yeah, you were hoping one of those guys would have a couple big days. Yeah. Uh, I'll go – this is this is harsh, but, um, like, I, I feel for Kyler Gordon, right? Like, he – you know, I, I'm not worried about him. I mean, he'll probably still be the starting corner week one. I don't think this is affecting. Is it going to affect his career? I'm just saying, just in in the in the you know microscope of OTA's mini camp, you would love to see your top draft pick get as many reps as he can. You know, to a lesser degree, same thing with Elijah Hicks, um, the safety. And again, there is injury; it's not their fault. Mm-hmm. So I don't want this to come off as like I'm blaming them for it. It's just. You know, you would just love for rookies to get as many reps as they can in these settings. And I'm sure they'll be fine for training camp. And, you know, Kyle Gordon could have a great career. And this is like nothing against him. It's just like if you're looking at if you're looking at the goals leading in the program, I bet you one of the goals was get a lot of reps from Kyler Gordon. And it after whatever happened, which we don't know, um, you know, we just didn't get to see him. Yeah, what's funny about you bringing that name up is I was actually considering him for the winner's list, but then left him off that because of, you know, the missed time he's had. But before that, like, he looked yeah, 
pretty damn good and a lot like Brisker in that, okay, plug and play starter. He's delivering, you know, he's as advertised in these practices. It just, whatever went down and whatever happened, um, which I'm not too concerned about. He's out. He was out there. I think that's a good sign. He was always out at practice. Yeah. And and the reason why we would be worried about this stuff is because um, this, this stuff tends to happen to the bears, right? All of a sudden, Tevin Jenkins isn't out there for training camp, you know, things like that. And so anytime you see a rookie who's all of a sudden not practicing and there's really no clear reason given, you start to get worried, but we've seen him out there. You know, watching him on that bike yesterday, it looked like he was, you know, in a tour de France or something like, you know, he was riding that thing like crazy. So I, I'm not too worried about it at this point. It's just to your point, and while you're siding towards more of like the not winning side of it, you want them out there. You you, you get a little worried when they're not. Yeah, that's all it is. And look, if I'm going to say another loser that's related to this, um, I understand, especially a brand new coach wants to be very careful with timetables and injuries and overly careful, especially this time of year. I get it. But when you're coaching a team, whose top pick seven years ago <laughs> just mysteriously wasn't at minicamp, and then yeah. suddenly shin splints turned into his career being derailed. And we've had other sim not similar, but we've had guys who it's like, oh, no, they'll be fine. So on the one hand, I get why they don't want to say anything if they don't know. But, like, it would help Kyler Gordon <laughs> if Matt Eberf was able to say, hey, listen, he turned his ankle. We're being extra, extra cautious. He's going to be 100% um, barring anything unforeseen for the start of training camp. Like yeah. that, to me, that wouldn't be difficult. And you know, I don't want to go on this long, too long of a rant here, but I had the same complaint about the way Matt Nagy treated Tariq Cohen thing. Yeah. If you read what Tariq Cohen went through, yeah. you ask yourself, why didn't the Bears just say that he had that extra injury and that yeah. extra surgery? Like or just, just, there's other ways to do that too, kind of behind yes. the scenes. Like it, they could have absolutely, I totally agree with that. They could have helped him for a guy who was going through so much that you, he had to be the one that revealed everything. And that's fine on his terms. Like there's not, that's not the, the issue. It's just like there are ways sort of behind the scenes to communicate that, Hey, look, there's a couple things going on here. Um, and right. then, you know, it would have ha- it would have been handled properly by everyone else. It just sort of did a disservice by like him mysteriously just not being available all season and then continually having to answer questions about it. Yeah, and, and I think like I just hope that the staff can it, you know look, look maybe Tree Cohen requested that I don't know, but I just hope that the staff understands that when a guy is not practicing and there's no no information given at all. It allows for speculation and it allows for people's minds to run wild and they might not think it's a big deal, but this is a social media world now. I mean, you saw how many people tweeted Tariq Cohen, you know, giving him a hard time for not playing. Yeah. And that's what I mean. He talked about that. And and so I don't think, again, Calgary is not anywhere near this level, but the reason I kind of bring up the situation is I just get a little nervous that, you know, we're going to have similar scenarios where you could just easily say, you know, al Qadi Muhammad, same thing. No one ever told us why, why he didn't practice. Like I didn't even think he was there for a while. Yeah. I was just, confused. Again, it, yeah. it doesn't hurt to, you know, just say – and there are ways to do it. So hopefully this is not going to be a common thing because – and this isn't even a reporter's gripe necessarily. I think the fans, you know, are always the ones asking us. They want to know. Right. And, you know, but – um yeah, but you're right. I think the most important thing about Kyler Gordon is it doesn't seem to be anything serious. And when he was out there, he looked pretty darn good. All right. We'll end with this conversation. What is the thing you are most looking forward to watching at training camp? Mm. Oh, can I throw out one more winner, though? Yeah. Matt Eberflus. I think... You know, I don't know how this is all going to work out. We're still in the honeymoon phase. I understand all that. But I do think that there is a lot more evidence pointing to the Bears and this team buying into Mm -hmm. what Eberflus is selling 
than any complaints or evidence that it's not working. Um, so for me, at where Eberflus is, I think that that's a win. I think that that's that puts him in the winners category, at least of where we stand right now. I think so too, and I actually kind of enjoyed watching his practices. I I, I think you can, and you can attest this as a football coach. You can see the the tempo at which they move, and I know mm-hmm. every coach says that that they do that, but I think you really felt it um, with with the way that they run practice. It's it's pretty it's pretty well run, it's, which is impressive for a first time coaching staff with so many new players and so many rookies. Um, you know, I know early early on it wasn't as smooth, and that obviously led to the penalty of losing a practice. But I think this week, especially the last two days, I think it was run really efficiently. Yeah, I agree with you on that. They they were more entertaining than the offseason practices usually are because they can be snooze fest sometimes. Hey, we all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Z-Biotics is the answer we've all been waiting for. Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Z-Biotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Z-Biotics before drinking alcohol, of course, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Give Z-Biotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash Adam to get 15% off your first order when you use Adam at checkout. Zbiotics is back with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. And July 4th is right around the corner. So order a pack of Zbiotics for you and your friends today to make sure you get it in time. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Adam. Use code Adam at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Hey, you guys have heard me talk about my Helix mattress and how much I love it. And and here's why. Because Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way that you sleep. I took the Helix quiz and I was matched with the Dusk mattress because I wanted something that felt firm. I sleep on my back, but it's not all the way firm. Okay, so I put that all in the quiz, gave them the information, and they matched me with the Dusk mattress. It came, it's really fun to unbox, it just sort of like inflates in front of your eyes, and then you get to lay on it and it's very, very comfortable. So if you're looking for a mattress, take the quiz, Order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress will come right to your door, shipped for free. You don't have to go to a mattress store. It's awesome. You don't have to take my word for it, though. Helix was awarded the number one best mattress pick of 2020 by both GQ and Wired Magazine. So here's what you do. Go to helixsleep.com slash Adam. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. They'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And they have a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. But trust me, you will. Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans. So a great night's sleep is never far away. And Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners, our Hogan Johns listeners, at helixsleep.com slash Adam. Um, all right. What are you looking forward to watching? We haven't even talked about the quarterback, so it's him, right? Yeah. I it's should just, have probably said it besides that, but yeah. No, that's uh, – yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we could talk about that. Uh, all right. Besides that, I, I have all these questions that I had in May – that still aren't answered. Yeah. Like, who is your starting offensive tackles? Mm-hmm. Who is your starting right guard? Who's going to break out at wide receiver? I would say the offensive line, though, because this is like we 
I said this to John's the other day. It's that I kind of try to remind myself. Like Ryan Poles knows something that we don't. You would think about the situation, right? He probably knows a lot that we don't know. I should like say. about how he hasn't like, really addressed that right guard thing. Yeah, it's like there's just something I'm not mm-hmm. getting. Like we know he's a former offensive lineman. We know his assistant's a former offensive lineman. We know how important the offensive line is. So I'm trying to like kind of give them the benefit of the doubt here. Like there's something that I don't understand that will be addressed in some way. But either way, I'm just I think we're all gonna know how these guys look when the pads come on. And I want to see, you know, who ends up being this team starting tackles. Yeah, I think that that's that's probably at the, right at the top of the list. And then I would just say too, then who emerges as the other wide receivers, right? Because yeah. that's it's like a huge toss up. I mean, it, it and I don't think Valus Jones, even if things are going well with him, that you can really, and maybe I'll be wrong about this, but I don't know that you can really define him as just like a clear cut number two. Because he uh, seems more like a Swiss Army knife type of dude. Yeah, if I had to, like, if if they had a game tomorrow, I think the number of targets would be ranked Mooney, Komet, Montgomery, Valus Jones. Maybe. Maybe. I think we still got to see how much the running back is going to get the ball in the backfield in this offense. But yeah, it'll probably happen because there's going to be screens. There's going to be swing passes there. Actually, Wheel. I thought, one of, I thought one of Field's best passes today was to Montgomery out in the flat. Yeah. Kind of snuck it uh, snuck it through a couple defensive linemen's hands. Bears fans don't um, want to hear about uh, passes yeah, under five yards anymore. Yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, but uh, they do happen. They they probably still will even in this offense. Do you have do you have like an overall assessment of like where are you at with Fields now that we've seen? Well, yeah, we it's seen like eight practices. I'm just kind of like. I think I'm at the point where I'm still optimistic about the whole thing. I, I was kind of, I think, expecting to feel a little bit better. Uh, um, I guess I was just a little bit surprised that there was so much ups and downs, so many ups and downs during camp or uh, during the offseason. And, and even that I'm admitting is a little bit unfair because we didn't get to see every day. You know, we right. and I was actually talking to Somebody probably doesn't want me to mention his name right now, but uh, somebody at practice today about that, and he was saying like they really need to start letting OTAs be open every day because it's just it kind of does a disservice to the players mm-hmm. because to just see three out of nine practices and make conclusions off of that, I mean, it's like what else are we supposed to do? We got to make conclusions off of what we're seeing, but it's not even half of the practices. It just doesn't even, it doesn't seem fair. And I get well, that. We, we missed apparently the best practice for the offense. Yeah. I, that, I, and that's that my Monday, point. Like, yeah. I wish, I wish I'd seen that. Maybe I would feel different. So yeah, maybe where, they could just post some highlights. Yeah. Well, and so to answer your question, like where I'm at, I'm still kind of like, wait and see, like I ask me a couple of weeks in the training camp because there we're going to be able to gauge on a daily basis whose arrows are pointing up, which ones are pointing down, how players are stacking practices. And I do think, as I've said many times, I think it's a very encouraging sign that we rarely, rarely, rarely see Justin Fields have two bad days in a row. I just, I'd like to see the consistency level be a little bit better. You know, he's going to have bad days. That's going to happen. But like maybe string three good days in a row, then have the rough day. You know, and then eventually get to four. And this goes back to what I'm saying. Like, maybe he, maybe all those practices we didn't get to see were good. Don't know. Don't know. I know it looked pretty damn good yesterday. I looked, I I saw a quarterback. I guess I was hoping to see more of what we saw yesterday on a regular basis, right? A quarterback clearly, clearly was in a rhythm, had good timing, had good accuracy, you know, was feeling himself, had the confidence. I don't doubt Justin Fields' abilities at all, and I still think he's going to be really, really good. I, it's just we're also – we learned through the Mitch Trubisky experience, like you kind of got to know by the end of this year. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You, yeah. you don't necessarily have to know that he's going to be a Hall of Famer. You just got to know if he's your guy. Yep. Uh, I'm with you on all that. I um, 
yeah, I, I, I'm left as minicamp ends wanting more. Like I wish I as I wish I saw more consistent drives, more consistent flash plays that we know he's capable of. There's probably a lot of a lot of reasons that are above, you know, that we don't understand that Luke Getzey could explain to us that about why you know they're trying things. There's all this newness around him. I mean, yesterday, think about this hoe too. Yesterday was his best day that we saw in person. And he was working on an offensive line that had three rookies, Sam Mustafer yeah. and Larry Borum. So, and he had a great day. I know so, that was what was yeah. crazy. Yesterday was like the, the, you know, they just went all rookie basically on the old line and it all worked out. So, you know, I, I'm not, for some reason, I feel like I've been painting as like this anti Justin Fields guy all of a sudden. And I, I'm really the opposite of that. I'm, and I think Bear, that's like Bears insider. Does Fields have what it takes? Do the Bears need to draft another quarterback? Oh, I'm sure that'll be a headline. Just please get the website right. It's all chgo.com. That is the website. Um, so please, if you're going to do that, please, uh, please get the website right. It, it's almost like you become a victim of your own high expectations, mm-hmm. right? Like my expectations for the kid are so high that like when he doesn't meet them, um, you're just like. Man, I was wishing to see a little bit more. But then that, and that's all. So I'm not making any conclusions at this point. Those expectations have not been lowered. I think that's a good thing. Um, and so we'll see when we get back, back to Bourbon A, as we used to say. We can't you know, the, say the, that anymore. This is a problem for the perception of Mitch Trubisky. I mean, there's a lot of other things that didn't go wrong with Mitch's time here, but there have been enough quarterbacks that you know right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or or pretty quickly. Um, you know, you you know, Joe Burrow is the latest, right? Now, luckily for Justin Fields, he doesn't have anybody in his draft class you can say that about. Um, right? Like there's nobody from last year's class that was not yet. It's kind of wait and see on all of them, you know. Yeah, so uh, other than, have... I guess people would say maybe say Mac Jones, but I think most people still look at Mac Jones and are like, Yeah, but there's a ceiling there. Right. I I like he doesn't have to deal with a Mahomes Watson situation, but I do think the way that we view the quarterback position is different. And these guys just don't have don't get that much time to to build and to learn and to understand the game better to then use their rare physical gifts to become stars. So, but yeah, I mean, he's going to be the number one storyline every single day um, for a long time. And he's all you know, training camp is going to be all about his progress in this offense, because as he said, the offense is not there yet. Yeah. Oh, I love this time of year. You know, it's I can't wait for training camp to start, but at the same time, I'm excited about the fact that there's five weeks in between that to actually enjoy summer in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty of time to get angry about White Sox base running. See, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> What's been... the, what, what? How's the Vernon Hills Red Sox base running? Uh, It's improved. You know, at that level, you're just trying to get them to run from base to base, and not just like kind of in the right in the right bases. Walk jog. Oh, they know the bases. They know the That's bases. Uh, although we did have a kid yesterday who he actually hit a very impressive double into the outfield, and he was so concerned about where the ball was going. Um, I turned around because I was you know coach pitching, and he was like near me. Like he he like veered towards the mound. He was so far out of the base pass. He actually cost himself a double because he. He was so far out of the base pass that I couldn't send him to second because it took him so long to get the first. I had a, I'll tell a quick story. When I coached 10 a few years ago, um, travel team. So like these kids, you know, they, they know all the stuff. They know mm-hmm. the basic baseball at this level. You know, guy, I think he, I want to say he was on second or first and maybe he was on first and I, you know, balls in the air and I'm yelling for him to tag up mm. and he just takes off. Oh no! And I want to say he like whatever he did. I don't remember what exactly happened, but the result was he had just this absolute moment of panic as he realized what he did wrong, and he ran like across the field to go back to the base. And it was one of those moments wow. as a coach, you're like, "What do you, you know?" And then you feel terrible for the kid because he obviously yeah. just like he just panicked. Um, and I, I like I was just like. I was I just completely didn't believe what had just happened, and then again, you know what? The White Sox do things that aren't that uh, dissimilar sometimes. Yeah, it, it's kind of the beauty and the the curse of coaching youth baseball is that once they the more they start to understand about the game, the harder they are on themselves. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when they strike out or something, it's like, man, you know, baseball can be cruel. You just got to, you're not going to get a hit every time. You just got to learn to accept that. But that's a hard thing for like a seven year old to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's really fun. So we'll get into the baseball season. Yep. Um, and uh, we'll show up to training camp on time. Whether or not John Z reports, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you guys. A couple of years ago, he went to Ireland instead of the start of training camp. Holy shit. I forgot about that. That that, that did happen. Yeah. He was telling George McCaskey about it the other day. Classic. Yeah. Classic. All right. uh, In the meantime, follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue at K Fishbane. He is the fish man. He does a great job. You should read his work on The Athletic. Theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns is where you go. To subscribe, you also can get John Z's uh, coverage from the first two days of minicamp, but not today. Not today because he was not there. Do you want to end with a bear or not a bear? Oh, sure. You got one for me? Willie Wright. Oh, you know what? You should come up with a different one because we did this uh, on the CHGO show today. Mm. Um, he I, wasn't, is a bear. I wasn't watching live. He is yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You were prepping for this show um, and probably writing for The Athletic. That, yeah, he is a bear. He is a bear. The one I got uh, Nick on was C.J. Avery. C.J. Avery. He's a bear. Yeah, he is a bear. Linebacker, but, Louisville. There you go. You look yeah. like you're looking at a roster right now. Well, I was just trying to remember who I was going to ask you about, and now I can't do it. But if I said, like, okay, so they have Greg Stroman Jr. Do you know that that's a bear? Did not know that. No. Okay. So I should have done that. But I was yeah, thinking in my head, yeah. Marcus Stroman, you know. Uh, yeah. 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 Mar- Mar- Greg Stroman Jr. is a bear. What number is he? 39, cornerback. Oh. Okay. Yeah. The more you know. Um, all right. We're out of here. Uh, we will not have a pod next week. We're going to take the week off. We'll be back the following week um, and pretty much go weekly. There may be another week where we're on vacation or something like that. But uh, don't worry. We'll get you ready for training camp, I promise. And when training camp gets here, we're full go. Full go, just like we always are every season. And I can't wait for that. But in the meantime, we are going to – this is the only dead period we get the whole damn year. All right? So we're going to enjoy it a little bit. And uh, we'll be back, probably have some fun with some movies, things like that. We'll make sure Kevin sees Top Gun, Jazzy sees Top Gun. It must happen. I'll go again with you if you want. I loved it. Uh, I have watched, I think, one movie start to finish in the last two or three years. Sounds like you had so, a child. It sounds yeah. like you had a child. Yeah. Moxie. It was a very good movie. Amy Poehler. Good movie. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Um, <laughs> this is what blows my mind about John Z. He has three kids, 700 baseball games, somehow watches every Marvel series. I, I don't I don't I I do not know how he does it. I watch Thanks. a lot of Top Chef. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, all right, we're out of here. We will uh, talk to you in a couple of weeks. Enjoy a little bit of a break, and uh, in the meantime, the CHGO Bear Show will still be daily, so you can check that out. We'll be there for you. Uh, appreciate everyone. Talk to you soon. See ya. <laughs>